All right, so uh, thank you for the warm welcome. We really appreciate it, both myself and uh, Sean Iyer here. Uh, so as you already can see, uh, the title of our talk is called Don't Google PowerShell Hunting. There's a little bit of a, a background there. We'll, we'll talk about that in the, uh, the actual presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our agenda. We're going to talk about the so what, really why you're here and spending your time with us for the next hour or so. We're going to talk about the state of the defense for PowerShell, um, state of the incident response for PowerShell, talk to talk a little bit to what PowerShell looks like while it's running, um, and then really kind of the bulk is collecting artifacts and what we're trying to get at. And finally, um, because you know any good, uh, any good research doesn't just end, we're going to talk about future work and where potentially Sean and I can take this forward or possibly hand it off to someone else and take it forward as well. Next slide, please. So who are we? So my, set, my name is Josh Rakowski. Um, I am an Army officer. I'm an incident response team leader for Thornton, uh, one different cyber protection team. Um, I am a programmer. I, I enjoy all things Python ish. I'm also one of the admins for Code Wars. If you're interested in doing a programming uh, competition, we host an online competition. Um, we also do some on-site stuff. I'm also a retro technologist, right? So, so forget about the future. I care about any technology and anything about the game technology. I like to people a lot. I like to revive it. And, uh, and so I do collect vintage video games, arcade games, and anything like that. And that's what really kind of uh, you know, drives me and keeps my, my passion when I'm not doing computer stuff. I'm working on uh, uh, ancient technology in, uh, in terms of what we look at today. So uh, be looking for his cameo role as a gunter in the upcoming uh, Ready Player One film. Okay, so Sean Iron is my name. My handle is Tony underscore 49. You can find me on Twitter that way. Or almost any social media service that uses handles like that. Tony 49 is between the English, is probably me. Um, if it's underscore in there, it means somebody else gave it to it first. So I am programming business, mostly Python, um, just like a lot of us out here. And I'm also an Army officer. So I work for uh, Josh Bukowski. He runs a couple of different teams. I uh, actually have another like, sister team video here. Um, so what my team actually does is we go out and do IRT and then we do uh, some risk assessments and we also do some threat hunting while we're out there. So kind of the jack of all trades. Uh, I'm not going to say I'm a master of all of them. Um, but besides that, so it's just my I like to run, read, write code, play video games, play the board games, card games, and go along seeing ice. Um, so then to close out this slide, we're going to be looking for my friend. Uh, nothing we say, we look, we look forward to the government, obviously, the government office, right? Nothing we say here reflects the gains of the government. None of this was done on the government's time. This is all completely independent research. Um, so nothing that we say actually at all ties back to uh, our employers whatsoever. That said, if you want to talk to us about the Indian Army, uh, we'll answer what questions we can, and what we can, we'll point you out to the next recruiting table that's out in the employer. All right, so here's the so what of our, of our talk. Um, a couple of things we, we found in, in our current jobs is, you know, partial hunting is hard, and that's what kind of drew the name, right? So we, when, you start, when you start doing some research, right, my go-to move is let me go straight to Google and just drop some terms in there and see what comes up. And so you, if you Google PowerShell hunting, you get maybe the first two pages full of how to hunt with PowerShell. And so it's a lot of different tools out there that people have written to do host space forensics. But what we're really looking at is how do we paint a picture of what PowerShell was run on the host to kind of say, okay, this is maybe patient zero in, in an instant response. How do we determine you know, what PowerShell was used to exploit that system? And it was kind of difficult for us to find, find that. So that's what kind of drove the name of the talk. So, you know, don't Google PowerShell hunting because it may, it may not give you what you want. Um, but because of that, what we determined is PowerShell hunting is hard. Right, so PowerShell is the, the go-to um, language for, for the adversary who wants to live off the land, essentially. They want to live filelessly, and they want to make sure nothing touches the disk as much as possible. So we see that. Um, what also makes um, PowerShell hunting hard is it's also a boon to admins and users alike. And so it's hard to restrict it. Um, but the next piece, like I said, is we, what we really want to get to, the, the so what of our talk is how do we determine um, what PowerShell was run on a compromised system? And then the next, as the, you know, if we're able to do that, and hopefully we can paint a picture that we can do that um, at this level, we wanted to make it scalable, right? So, so incident response is fantastic, but if you're doing one host at a time, uh, it gets a little tedious. And so we're trying to, we want to see if we can go ahead and take this and build uh, a scalable method. So again, our goal for our talk here and for our research overall is to find a reliable method to locate post execution artifacts and including the PowerShell script text itself, because that's really the, the, the gold nugget that we're looking for. That'll tell us what was actually, um, what occurred on the system um, with PowerShell. Next slide, please. 
So I'll hand off to Sean for the state of the defense. All right, so we've got obviously lots of things and notes here that I could refer. I'm going to read them all to you um, so that you both think of me. Actually, so let's get this a little bit interactive. We're going to toss out a question to start. Um, softball to start, to start, to start, whoa, thank you today. To start us off, softball question. Who knows what does the actual heavy lifting for PowerShell when it does its execution? Is he one hand? Yes, sir. The um, system automation. Okay, you're missing one word in it, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. So system management automation is the DLL that does absolutely all of the heavy lifting for PowerShell. So as we begin to go through the rest of this, you're going to see a lot of this focus on PowerShell.ac, but underneath the hood, that DLL will always be loaded. And we'll talk about this again in the future. Even when a different executable is running uh, PowerShell code, it's going to load that DLL, and that's going to do all the interpretation and then uh, start execution. So state of the defense, who has been in an environment where PowerShell is active for all of its users? I see yeah, a bunch of fans, right? Who's been in an environment where command prompt was disabled for all the users, but PowerShell is completely unrestricted? Right? Yeah. So, so we actually see this a lot when we're out on the job and whatnot. And uh, we typically hear, well, we can't block it because they're admin speed, which is also typically true. Uh, it's the unfortunate reality that we work with when we're defending against PowerShell-based attacks is it's a management and automation framework, like the DLL's name implies, not simply a shell. So we can't just turn it off. But there's a lot of things that we can do to begin to harden against it. So powering through the slides, attackers like to use it. Uh, there's multiple attack platforms out there that make this available to everybody. You've heard of PowerSploit, you've heard of uh, PowerShell Empire probably. And they allow you to use PowerShell as the basis to launch attacks and to persist on systems wirelessly as well as using traditional methods running through the uh, scheduled tasks, registry, uh, temporary files, started folders, stuff like that. Right? Um, but the really juicy thing that PowerShell gives to attackers is direct access to WMI. And if you really want to learn some cool stuff about this for free, jump online, go to Paul Security Weekly on YouTube, and look for the tech segment that Carlos Perez talks about the basics of abusing WMI events, and you'll see just how dangerous this can be. Um, so we've already covered all the different persistence methods, so next slide please. The final point on there where we said Skid's going to APT is just call out these, again, they're in the common platforms. So any script kitty can get on and can use WMI for persistence nowadays, whether they understand that's what's going on underneath the hood or not. So that's where we start to really get concerned with the off balance between attack and defense. So um, starting with PowerShell version 2, we're going to walk all the way up to version 5. What you can do to defend uh, and what you can do to bypass those defenses. So we all know that Windows 7 has been running since 2014, and nowadays 10 is the, is the way to go. 7 is common on enterprise. WannaCry showed us that if nothing else did, right? XP is still common on enterprise, honestly, but 7 is what a lot of the ones that we encounter are built off of. Um, so a lot of what we see is people going to the first Google hit of how can I defend PowerShell, and your first hit is probably always going to be execution policies, right? So there's like five different ways to, to restrict execution policies. And the uh, probably most common one is just straight restricted, where you can't run any scriptlets on the machine whatsoever, the .ps1 files. This is so trivial to bypass. Oftentimes, user controls are not set up properly, and any user can literally type in the command, execution policy bypass, or sorry, the, the argument, execution policy bypass, when they're running a PowerShell script. It's so like PowerShell.exe, tack execution policy, space, bypass, straight on. Right? And this will work against any restricted setting that you have on it. If you set it to code signed only um, or no execution, all five different settings, whether established by the group policy or the local computer's policy, would be bypassed with that simple command if your user's uh, privileges aren't properly restricted. If they are, if you can get a little Latin, there it's going to be it. So we go past that and we say, well, we can watch the PowerShell event logs. So, turning to my notes, we have a ton of different event logs for PowerShell version 2, um, but it says right here basically all we get to see is when the sessions are started, stopped, and terminated, and that's just really useless information when it comes to forensics. It, it will help you build your timeline of what happened, but it's not going to tell you anything of what happened running through uh, signed PowerShell. So that's a loss there. We do, we do know what ports it runs on, it runs remotely, so that's a win, right? Those aren't going to change. But they are going to change because they're only in the default ports. But if you see activity on that, you know what you're not expecting to see. Okay, that is a quick win. And then we know that we can use profiles to establish transcription with PowerShell v2 and up. 
But the problem is profiles are just PowerShell scripts and they're editable on the computer. So if you're a wise attacker, you're gonna go in, hit Control F, and look for the command start attack transcript. You're gonna see it's there, you're just gonna delete it and move on. Right? And you can do this on all four of the basic profiles really fast without having to do a lot of effort. And again, anything you can do to restrict power to the two most likely admin privileges are going to allow you to bypass it. Now, some of you are thinking, what about things like AppLocker and you know, Syscon and other stuff like that to help audit it? We're going to cover that in a couple slides. V3 gives us some better uh, forensics logs that we can actually use. So we're actually starting to move forward. There's not a whole lot to say in counterpoint to what advances V3 made. Um, it's just that they're not quite the logs that we need yet to do well. Next slide, please. So then we get to V5, and we, we get really excited because we finally did it, right? So now Windows audits scripts for us, and script blocks for us, too. So with the introduction of the anti-malware uh, scanning interface, AMSI, third bullet on the slide there, you're actually going to see when PowerShell is run, it's going to be run through AMSI to look for something that might be suspicious. And then anything that Windows finds suspicious and can be tuned on top of that is going to be logged into your event logs. On top of that, your base 64 encoded code is going to be logged into it as well as the clear text code. And this is all stored in your event logs. Um, we can also turn on system-wide transcription. In big enterprises where your admins use this a lot, it's going to roll really fast, right? But at least it's still there, so you might be able to catch something in that. Um, but the big counterpoint to all of this is the way the .NET works. So this is the kind of depressing point. When you install the new version of .NET to move up to PowerShell 5, the old version is not automatically uninstalled. Let us see it for a second. I upgraded my version to .NET 4 or whatever. Like number 2 is still there. So the attacker gets on my box. And he's going to do PowerShell 5, he's going to go on 3 MC, but he's going to do some quick recon, right? And he's going to be like, oh, PowerShell 2 is still here, so let me drop down into PowerShell 2. System-wide transcription gone, right? And now on top of that, he's going to run something like, I think it's Invoke Ghost from PowerShell. Um, some similar command to that, which is going to kill all the LSAS's threads that are updating event logs. Then he's going to kill your event log, so now your event log is empty, it's not repopulating, and then he's going to do whatever he wants to your system because he controls PowerShell. So, the long story short from those three different talk throughs is this is a really hard thing to defend. Defense in depth is hard to create for PowerShell. Defense based on a single point is going to fail against an attack who has any level of creativity. So basically, if you're better than Wizard Squad, you're probably going to succeed. Um, so it's not just about watching the automation framework, though. This is the, the key point here. So. Anything you do is going to create other artifacts. So if they are persisting with WMI optics, that's going to go into the event log for WMI optic creation. And we just talked about some ways to bypass created event logs, but there are other things you can rely on. You have operational logs for WinRM. Um, so anything that uses PowerShell or loading is going to produce, is going to write over WinRM, and that's going to produce WinRM operational logs. You have the app logger, which is going to enable you to do some restriction of, you know, I can use app logger to block PS1s from being run. Okay, that's not going to stop someone from using the interactive mode. I can block PowerShell.exe that way, and I can also audit the use of the DLL that it, was, that it relies on. And that third one is actually what you're going to want to do if you want to use AppLocker card in your defenses, because, and specifically audit it instead of just block it. Um, well, okay, risk decision, make it in your own enterprise. Um, <clears throat> but by auditing it, you'll see any time it gets loaded. On top of that, if it gets sideloaded into a different executable that's not signed on Windows, you'll actually generate an event ID for uh, basically mismatched code signatures. Um, so let's see, we can monitor for remote shells. People probably know about that. You can use Sysmon or any other monitoring solution to specifically watch for system.management.automation. And you want the star in there because it will actually mutate the name based on the .NET framework that you're using. Uh, and then finally, you've got two other things. Well, we already talked a lot about the show. Constrained language is another thing you can do. Constrained language is an environmental variable. And this is how your, your Surface tablets actually lock this down, so PowerShell's not as uh, strong. Constrained language mode robs PowerShell of about half its power. And you can go in and you can set this from the shell itself and say, you know, um, constrained language mode equals true or whatever. I actually have a syntax in here, but I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but again, this is something that an admin can revoke. And then, you know, click of a mouse, type a couple things real fast, and you're in Next slide, please. So then we pass it off to looking at incidents response. 
All right, and so like I said, when we first started doing our research, we found that there's a whole bunch of stuff out there about the tools that hunt with PowerShell, but not, not that much to hunt PowerShell itself. You know, what little was left over, we found that there was actually a, a lot of knowledge as far as uh, looking for PowerShell remoting. So, so because of that, because it's a, a well-documented problem thanks to FireEye and, uh, and it leaves reliable uh, parsable artifacts in memory, we went ahead, we didn't go down that route. And so we just wanted to kind of say that, make a call out to it. You know, you're gonna find those artifacts in WinRM and, and in DCOM launch. So if, if someone's remoting to your system with PowerShell, you're gonna find those artifacts um, in memory, easily parsable. Um, other ways you can actually look for it, again, these are, you know, these are kind of vague because you know, there wasn't much out there as we started to dig into it. You know, traditional methods for de detecting persistence is one. So if they want to go ahead and basically forward code their PowerShell script and throw in the registry key, if you're looking through the registry keys, you're, you possibly can find that. Um, looking at the, uh, we talked about PowerShell profile. So if they went ahead and the, the adversary, the attacker on the system, um, replaced your, the profile with something else, if you go check the profiles, you're going to see that right away as long as you know what, what normal is for PowerShell profiles. Um, WMI is another way you can also look for that, that detecting persistence uh, with PowerShell. You know, you're going to look for that SIM database, um, just running strings on objects.data, and that's just the way that the system stores information about itself and be able to hand off to anyone else. Um, you can also look for PowerShell.exe running under WMI.exe. That's another artifact looking for persistence, and also looking for calls to get WMI object. Um, also, like I said before, you know, artifacts for uh, left behind by PowerShell are scattered across Google. It's very, very uh, few and far between as we discovered, and that's why we decided to focus on the host based forensics of PowerShell and not the remoting. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to pause for fast because yep. the answer to this question is on the next slide. Okay, so this one's a little bit more of a softball. Does anyone know how to check what version of PowerShell you're working with from the interactive command line? I saw nice, nice beard and a hat. Uh, PS version tables? Yes. Right, so, oh, you got it, sir? Yep, yep. who's that? Who's the hat right there? <clears throat> Did it not? Oh, wrong button. So now we're gonna go into what normal looks like. Uh, like we previously said in the state of the incident response, we're not gonna cover remoting. Um, remoting is, is covered in quite a bit of detail by FireEye's paper, um, which was presented at Black Hat 2014, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so if you Google Black Hat, FireEye 2014, or something like that, you'll find it pretty fast. Um, and then it's about 15, 20 days long, lots of good details, go check it out. Long story short, for what PowerShell looks like running remotely, it's gonna spawn a process <coughs> underneath WinRM if it's actually using PowerShell by the AC, um, and that's gonna be the same one with logs and uh, stuff like that that we previously discussed. Another quick one for that one, the entire script that's run remotely will be pushed into WinRM's memory space uh, and will be retrievable in more or less XML format. So you can actually parse WinRM's memory space for uh, you know, bending bracket, script, close, close bracket, and it will uh, return almost every single result within it. So you don't actually need to know what the script looks like because you can go straight to that within that memory space. Um, so our environment that we did our experiments on, we ended up using a VM, wanted to do a whole lot of problems that, that came up with that. Um, mostly just our hardware stuff and kept crashing. So we had a VM running Windows 7, SD1, 64 bit. We were running with PowerShell version 2. There's a reason we did that. Um, PowerShell version 2 is the most common denominator. It comes on default uh, with Windows 7, so a lot of enterprises still running Windows 7. PowerShell version 2 is the most likely to be encountered in the wild. It's the same reason why you end up looking at 32-bit uh, malware when you first start studying reverse engineering, because that can still run on 64-bit systems. Uh, and then a lot of PowerShell version 2 stuff is still usable on version 5. So you find a lot of attack platforms are actually built on the syntax and features of version 2 because it is the lowest common knowledge. The context we examine, so first and foremost, the user clicks PowerShell on the AC from the task bar, and it pops open the shell and they start doing whatever. Then we looked at, they double click on a .ps1. We also look at that from them running a PS1 from within a shell. Uh, then we ran some PowerShell stuff within a schedule task and added the run key. And then finally we built a WMI object that actually used a uh, <coughs> event consumer to then run more PowerShell. So all of the ways that we built our persistence were, were injected in with PowerShell commands and then also did the next stage with PowerShell to, uh, command as well. Next slide, please. So now we're going to uh, we're going to bore you with a bunch of process trees, but you know, like, we, was anyone else in uh, Ms. Torres' talk? Is that what we're talking? It's a really bad uh, presentation. Um, so she talked about it at the end when someone asked a question. 
you know, you need to know what normal looks like, so go grab the SANS poster that has all the information on it. Uh, definitely recommend that. So this is the same thing as stuff we're talking about. So when a user executes PowerShell by the AC from the desktop, just opening the, the interpreter, Explorer is going to spawn PowerShell XE, and it's going to spawn its own uh, console host. This is on Windows 7 specifically. On Windows 10, these mutate a little bit, but overall, the, uh, the process trees are fairly, fairly consistent. Mostly what's going to change on Windows 10 is where con host is going to spawn out from under. Um, so then we have another option. You open up command prompt and you type in powershell.exe and click enter. And so explorer is going to spawn command, obviously, and the command is going to spawn PowerShell. But CSRSS is going to spawn the console host. And you'll see this is pretty consistent across all the different contexts. The PowerShell runs under the Next slide, please. So, okay, the next, the next slide has some bad puns, um, so we'll laugh. Anyways, double click to run uh, of a PS1 script, Explorer, will spawn command.exe, which will then run uh, PowerShell within. So you'll notice that you know, even just double clicking about PS1 is going to reintroduce uh, uh, CMD.exe into that. And because that context has its own console host, you'll see console host spawn under the, underneath C, CSRSS. Then if you run it from, from the PS1 from the PowerShell command line, then you'll get Explorer, CMD, PowerShell XE, and then it's very close to identical. So if anyone can't tell Next slide, please. So running it out of the scheduled task, so this is actually kind of fun. This script does actually self-destruct um, every let's see, what is it? 20 minutes. Um, so we went into, we used PowerShell command, create a scheduled task. Goes in, task name, just going to cover the code real fast. Don't gloss over too bad. Very evil scheduled task, right? What it's going to do is it's going to call the actual specific path of PowerShell.exe. Um, Taxi means command. PowerShell interprets a lot of stuff for you. You don't have to use the full spell out word. It does this kind of dynamic interpreting. So I probably should have done like type or tap com or something like that and still catch it. So then while basically true, run this evil infinite loop to just keep saying I'm an evil scheduled task. So if you as an instant responder can't find me as I'm right in front of you on the screen, then you need to go back to school. Um, then it will sleep for about five seconds and then it's going to respawn this task every 20 minutes. And the slash k is where it actually kills its previous uh, version and restarts. So what this does, the so service host is going to spawn this. Uh, we didn't go into what service host looks like. Um, what service host is going to run underneath is fairly well documented. So we trust that all of you guys can find that on Google and on other sources of information. So cutting about half the tree off, service host will spawn has the engine, and then that will actually run PowerShell. Uh, EXE. And then CVS RSS will spawn when execution starts and create the console host as well. This is assuming that you leave the window visible. Obviously, these are very simple cases that we're covering, and attackers can do a lot to make this a lot more discreet. One, they can name it something that's not going to make it obvious. They can hide the windows, they can make it non interactive, all these other things that might keep it from coming straight into your face. Next slide, please. Running out of the registry, this is my worst button. By far, don't laugh at this one, it's terrible. Um, <coughs> not the old <laughs> Explorer.exe spawns PowerShell, CSRSS spawns Conhost. It's pretty cut and dry. This is what you expect to see out of the registry. We did notice if you're not experienced with PowerShell, the strings will kill you. Um, so, double quotes are interpreted strings, and single quotes are raw strings. And if you want to escape and do a, a raw string, you actually need to use the backwards tick. That's above your escape key, um, or by your escape key. So to get this to run properly, I actually need to basically more code it so that the strings would stop kicking my butt. Um, but that's essentially what's going on is inside the run key. It's just a, a call PowerShell tax C, basic or sorry tax ENC for encoded command and basically more encoded command and for uh, Next slide, please. This slide named after you know, APT 2829, uh, running around with the ENC, it's pretty good. So if you want to know more about how APTs use WMI objects in PowerShell to uh, make people cry, check out CrowdStrike's uh, articles, Bear Hunting and Bears in Our Mitts, and they talk about 2829s using this specifically. Um, so Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, uh, get abbreviated Fuzzy Bear in this slide. So when a net spawns this, it spawns services XE, uh, which service host then comes down. WMI PRVSE is going to do all your heavy lifting for your WMI stuff. And PowerShell running out of a WMI context is actually going to spawn 
right there. And then console host is still going to spawn even if the window doesn't render. So what we ended up doing was crushing a uh, command line event consumer into the sim database, which is how this all works on the back end. And even though we didn't say to hide the window, the window never rendered, but it still spawns out visible in the process. So here we're going to pause for our last question, if you're good with that. For the no, I'll, I'll wait till the end of my Okay, so we're going to come back to this, but think about this for a little bit. All right, next slide. Is this my slide? Or is it yours? I think it's mine. Okay, I'm kind of talking to you, too. I've got it. Yep, memory artifacts. So there are some artifacts that are always left behind. Um, first thing we discovered, doing some, some Googling, we actually found that uh, when PowerShell executes, it loads the entire script into memory. Uh, which is a big problem because that means what, if you can find the entire process, you can read exactly what the attacker or the administrator did. Uh, however, scripts are not reliably structured. So you can't just use a regex to look across all the memory and pull every single PowerShell script out. Even though you know the PowerShell commands are typically verb noun structure, that doesn't mean that you can just be like, oh, everything's going to be you know a verb of three letters long and attack or whatever. If you try to use regex on this, trust me, you're going to get a lot of false positives. Um, so we found two things as we started verifying this research for ourselves. If you run a base64 encoded command, that command is going to be a memory. And then the interpreted command, basically the unpack script, will be a memory as well. And then you're going to have other copies of it in Endian format where it started interpreting this and, and running it. Um, you're going to have two plain text strings that are always there. And we use, I'm going to say always even though it's not necessarily true for the second one. System.management.automation because it's going to be an import address table, will always be in a process, that string, that plain text string will always be in a process that loads that deal up. This is the basic concept that makes using strings to analyze processes uh, work. It's gonna be the IAT worst case scenario, but it's also gonna be mentioned everywhere within that process stuff. PowerShell will be there if PowerShell is used to run it, and will probably be there for most contexts where it's not, because when the console is being loaded, there's all this help information in the background that could be referenced, and it's kind of similar to, to a prefetch sort of thing. It's preloaded. So it'll still end up in memory most of the time, but we don't have enough confidence to say it could be all the time. But the key thing we wanted to solve here is what if the script is actually terminated? So we all know we can use volatility and recall, right? We can, we can analyze the crap out of any process that is still running. Even if it's been hidden from the process execution block, we know that our forensic tools can reliably find ones that are still allocated. And we also know that attackers can't completely unallocate their uh, attacks from running memory because then it'll get overwritten and it'll crash. So we wanted to look at post exploitation and say, what if the script is completed? What if the process is terminated? Can we still reliably pick up these artifacts from memory? Next slide, please. So this leads to semi reliable collection. Um, so as we already said, you can't, you can't target a script you know nothing about. If you want to look for PowerSploit or PowerShell Empire in memory, you can collect all the, the module names, all the command names, and you can search across dynamic memory for all those strings. And it's not going to be quick, it's not going to be pretty. If you have an enterprise, more than one machine, it's going to take you forever in a day. So those are scripts you know, you, know nothing, you know something about, but if you know nothing about what the attacker did, you can't reliably target the script at all. It's just no information there. So we've got to skip that, and we've got to go after the stuff we know is always going to be there. So we examined RAM dumps, and we looked for those two strings we talked about in the previous slide. And basically, we just kind of pulled samples out of memory to see what would be uh, in the area surrounding So we paginated the, the RAM, and then we you know, pulled out the artifacts, and we looked at it in a rather naive order to see uh, what we could learn from it. So what we see is basically, if you pull out uh, the artifact system management automation, uh, what we found with that one is we didn't always find the script, but if we pulled out stuff based on PowerShell, we always found the script. And then we could use the overlap of the two actually to reliably find the script and then restitch it together, again in a naive order, we just kind of swap it together so we would be fine. Um, so using those two artifacts actually enables you to, once uh, execution has terminated, you can go and still use those two artifacts to grab enough memory to find the, the scripts that were run. However, this is not super reliable, um, primarily because you're stitching the process blocks back together in the wrong order, or possibly in the wrong order, um, which is what the last bullet is talking about. It's hard to tell the order, and it's hard to isolate specifically the scripts. Next slide, please. 
All right, so to, to kind of pick up, so that's, that's where we kind of ended, right? So, so we had this grandiose idea of getting to an actual releasable tool to be able to, uh, to basically work from the bottom up. And so when I say bottom up, what I'm really talking about is, so if you, if you use volatility for instant response, you're starting from the top down, right? So you're looking at the process, you're looking at the processes, and then from there you might use ES scan or, or uh, PSX view to get down to some of the only processes or terminated processes. Um, but that's starting from the top and then digging down into the process. Once you find the process, and you can dump the memory of that process using uh, Procmon or Process Hacker, and then get into the actual contents of that process. So what, what we're proposing and what, we what we're working on currently, whenever uh, we just didn't have a chance to finish overcome by events of life and what they work and whatnot, is a tool that will work from the bottom up. So basically looking for some of those standard, uh, so the PowerShell or system management automation in memory. And then once we find it, you know, even if it's a terminated process, take that and go ahead and back it back out it as far as we can, either by, um, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the way it's linked or the, the way the pages are supposed to be in there uh, for coherency. Um, so that's what, we're looking, that's what we're talking about with the future work. So, you know, essentially, what if we can find all the instances of PowerShell or system management automation in memory and align them to processes. So volatility can facilitate on active processes. Uh, so the workflow that we're, we're proposing is we're building out the work uh, of a tool called PC Finder Pearl by Schuster released back in 2006. Create all, all possible e-process blocks out of memory, um, including the exited uh, ones. We're still working on that piece, as you can see there, we're looking for some of those offsets. Um, they're not uh, readily available. And then use that to find artifacts, right? So we're, we're trying to work up. We're trying to find it in memory and then use that to work up. Again, we're trying to make, trying to get to the point where it's uh, a, an easily reproducible process and then a scalable process. Because right now, if we try to go out and do this for, so the, the VM we're working in had two gigs of memory. And so even then it was kind of, I'm kind of cumbersome to go and do that search in the memory, but if we have a system that has thir uh, 16 or 32 gigs of memory, it's gonna become a, a, uh, a lesson in, in, in staying patient, waiting for that to happen. Um, so we're trying to, you know, again, knock away all the, all the, 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 the chat essentially and get down to what we want. And then essentially, once we get to the, you know, stitch back as far as we can, hand off that process to an analyst to examine. That's the workflow we're proposing, and uh, we're, we're really getting after right now. Uh, essentially, we're going we're to extend the recall or volatility or uh, develop a GER workflow. Um, exactly, not sure how to um, proceed yet on that. Once we get the tool finished, then we'll, look, we'll work on getting it embedded into volatility or recall. Um, and again, generalized research. Um, Taking it to the next step. Right now, we're trying to key off some some keywords in there. Uh, the next step is um, vol uh, sorry, not volatility, but um, PowerShell carved out some run spaces. You know, if you, if you use Python, you can you know about namespaces. Uh, PowerShell carves out run spaces, and so we're possibly looking at the, there's some triggers off of that. We can look for some coherent memory at the beginning of that that will identify that run space for PowerShell. Uh, next slide, please. So at that point, um, this concludes our, our presentation. Uh, we wanted to see if there are any questions or, or any, uh, any comments you have for us as we move forward. Like I said, we're not, we're not quite done working the tool yet, so any feedback is definitely good feedback. Yes? Do you have any books that you recommend for PowerShell? Books that I recommend for PowerShell? Okay, um, I, I don't have any ones that I recommend because I'm not, I'm not a PowerShell um, uh, programmer. So I haven't actually gotten into books. Uh, what I'm doing right now, I'm actually going to Carlos Perez's uh, Dark Operators class for DerbyCon next week. Um, the slides that he does for that class as well as for the um, DEF CON, you see the DEF CON or the Black Hat one, are available online. And there's about 150 slides in the deck, maybe, maybe more. And there's a lot of really good detail in there about the basics of how it works, even if you can't hear him brief those uh, to you. So I would go, they're on his GitHub, go check it out. I think his GitHub is dark underscore operator. Um, it's one of the two. And <clears throat> past that, he's got a couple good talks that are out there uh, for getting familiar with it. I would also check out, I think it's Matthew Graber. I might be mispronouncing his name. He's got a lot of good work out there on it. And then, uh, shoot, the guy. Um, let's read this guy's name. I can, I can look it up for you afterwards. There's another guy that I follow on Twitter who does a lot of work with uh, PowerSploit and Empire. Um, so a lot of how I've been learning this is looking at attacker methods and then trying to re reproduce them without a framework to do it for me. Um, so that's, yeah, that's my approach. Thanks. Yes, sir. Is there any way to tell, uh, or could you be alerted, for instance, uh, that the execution policy has changed? Like if I'm going to check my execution policy and it's restricted, but someone's, I mean, is there an easy 
Is there any way to secure that? I, I need to double check, but I believe the answer is yes. I think, uh, especially with the higher versions of PowerShell, um, there's, there should be an event log that actually keeps track of that getting changed. Um, and I think on the lower versions, it might actually, it's actually tracked by the registry. So it should be tracked as the uh, numbers escaping me. The event log for registry uh, value changed. Alex? I was going to say, uh, in regards to the books, uh, Learn Windows PowerShell and Month of Lunches by John Jones. Uh, one, I read that's a really good uh, kind of overview of PowerShell. And it's like 30, uh, like one hour kind of like PowerShell lessons. And that's a, I thought it was a really good introduction to kind of cover a lot of bases of PowerShell. Yeah, thanks. Oh, it's Sean Metcalf's the third name I was looking for. He's a other big guy. Yes, sir. Blue shirt? Yeah, so, um, so we ran out of time. That was going to be our sixth use case, and we got bogged down in memory forensics. And honestly, like we we realized we didn't know as much about memory forensics as we thought we did, and have to go relearn some basics. So we kind of dove into the tool and designing a framework for actually building the tool. It did not get to that use case, so unfortunately I'm not qualified to speak on it in detail. Any more questions? Wow, awesome. So we've got one more giveaway here. Um, the question is mine to ask, and so I said at the beginning I'm a, I'm a retro technologist. Yeah, we're gonna go deep on this one, right? Ah. Let's see here. Who here knows about, about Pac-Man? What about Pac-Man, right? What am I going to ask? Which one? Which version? Which version? Which version? The first one, the original. The deterministic system Pac-Man. Talking about the expand guy game? Yeah. Going way back. Uh, so how many levels are there in Pac-Man? 92. 256. 256. What happens in the 256 level of Pac-Man you get there? Damn, I can kill screen. I can kill screen. on the game itself. <laughs> and you have to treat those blank and the talents are done in the normal place of the main, so to get the perfect score on the game, you have to have the main memorized exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>